so my talk will be towards single molecule X-ray diffraction spectroscopy of proteins in quantum chemistry in the surface of, in the service of molecular imaging. So what I will tell you about, I'll try to tell you about, is what are the new ways in which people are trying to do now this uh, molecular imaging and molecular uh, X-ray structure of, of molecules. So and how uh, we think that quantum chemistry can help us to do this. So let's see what's uh, the objective, first of all. Suppose we have a protein. And we all understand that in order to understand its reactivity, we should rather know the structure of the protein. And we all know the standard way to do it. You first crystallize it, then you do the conventional X-ray uh, spectroscopy, you decipher the structure, and so on. The problem, however, uh, along this way, starts even on step one. It is not possible to crystallize just every protein. And even when it's possible, it's all very often a very hard, very difficult task. So people have long thought about a way around this difficulty. And one way around that appears to be plausible, especially in, in view of uh, uh, Nobel Prizes that were given to chemists who succeeded to put whole proteins into the gas phase, I mean Maldi and electrospectroscopics. One way around it would be to have a protein molecule in the gas phase and to shine X-ray in it to measure the X-ray diffraction structure of a single molecule. However, such, an, such a naive approach would at, at first seem unfeasible because we don't have this huge enhancement of the signal by the periodic crystalline structure. So what we have to do is to shine really very, very strong, very intense X-ray pulses. And here, this connects us to another technological achievement of the recent years, I would say the recent decade, and this is the construction of the powerful X-ray free electron lasers at several facilities worldwide. These are billion dollar devices. One is in uh, Stanford, the other one's being finished in uh, Hamburg. Uh, in Germany, another one is, uh, is developing its spring facility in Japan. And others, I'm sure, will be, will be built in other countries. These devices do provide us with very short and very intense X-ray pulses that one can think could be sufficient for taking a diffraction image of a single protein. The problem, however, is that as we will ta be taking this diffraction picture, the protein will, just that, will do just that. It will, it will blow up, it will decompose, because what we call radiation damage is in usual crystallography is a spectacular, is a tremendous effect here. We cause vast ionization of the molecule. The positive charge accumulates. We form a plasma. And finally, we have Coulomb, expl Coulombic explosion of the molecule. So the question is really, what happens first? This process, which is modeled here using, using rather simple molecular mechanics tools, or the accumulation of the meaningful diffraction picture, which tells us something about the structure of the intact molecule. So if we want to do it, we should better be able to predict the radiation damage. And if we want to predict something, we would like to understand it. So all this, uh, inner shell of, all this inner shell physics that we thought we understood from synchrotron studies comes now in a, in a new uh, environment that we shall explore in a minute. And quantum chemistry does have a job, a big job to do here. So that's basically all my talk. Uh, the rest will be the just the details. So let's go, in, <coughs> sorry, let, let's go in the details. Uh, how do we imagine this macromolecule <coughs> sorry, interaction with the XFL? Well, the XFL beam comes. It certainly ionizes the molecule. Since these are KEV photons, they will predominantly ionize core and not the valence shell, which means something interesting will be, will be happening. And something interesting are the plethora of inner shell processes. For example, Auger decay like this. We will explore JDK in, 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 in a minute. All kinds of interatomic processes. Uh, electrons will be released. Some of the electrons will be trapped because of massive, because massive ionization will create positive charge background, which leads to trapping of the electrons, and so on. So in the core, in really in the heart of all this, is the, uh, in the heart of all these processes leading to radiation damage, are the de electronic decay processes of the type where a vacancy is formed by ionization of one of the four orbitals, and this vacancy is filled and another electron is ejected. Why is it important? It's important in two ways. 
Well, first, since electrons are ejected here, it leads directly to the accumulation of positive charge, which contributes to the Columbic explosion. However, it also leads to something positive and to something useful. Because as we fill the core orbitals, we contribute to a better, to a higher quality diffraction picture because it is these core, core, or core electrons that will be ultimately responsible for the useful signal that we are going to get. So the, the common picture is electron going here, one electron is ejected, this core hole decays exponentially in time and we would like to know more about this and we would like to appreciate the fact that all this happens in massively ionized system. How strongly ionized? Well, we, can do, we, we, we cannot uh, model proteins maybe really well, but we can model big clusters really well and if we look at such uh, uh, mo such simulations, we look inside what happens inside an XFEL pulse of let's say 100 femtosecond long, we should observe that the, our cluster is typically at least singly ionized in all its atoms. So this is the new environment and in this environment we would like to understand how different is the time scale of the core hole decay, what is the possible role of interatomic decay processes, what is uh, uh, m how close is the real core hole dynamics is mu in multiply ionized system to the familiar exponential pattern that we all know from uh, the synchrotron studies, from low intensity studies. And we also would like to ask the, the a more audacious question of how can one maybe control all these processes in order to, ma to manipulate the time scale of the electronic decay and eventually of the columbic explosion. So what we really need is a thorough understanding of electronic decay dynamics in highly ionized polyatomic systems. And <clears throat> we should start from small and go uh, and simple and go to more complex stuff. So the simple stuff was discovered as early as 1925. Pierre Auger wrote a paper on complex photoelectric effect in which he, shi uh, he shined radiation and he uh, made this core hole and he got uh, some electrons which unlike uh, with the energies which unlike uh, photoelectrons the energy of the of his Auger electrons was not dependent on the initial photon energy so what how can it be and what is this composite co com uh, or complex photo effect well very simple you, you burn this hole now this uh, is actually a very highly excited state of in this case neon plus this electron can fill the vacancy it's enough it giving this electron enough energy to be ejected to the continuum and the energy of this electron depends only on the quantized levels of singly and doubly ionized neon so really it has no it bears no uh, reminiscence of the initial photon energy well uh, next year the Schrodinger wave function was written and just one year after that Gregor Wenzel whom uh, Joshua if he's still here Okay, uh, uh, already mentioned, wrote a seminal paper, Überstrahlung Lose Quantum Sprünge, so on radiationless quantum jumps, and there he derived what we, what we all know as Fermi Golden Rule. So Fermi Golden Rule is actually Wenzel, and this, this uh, for this specific case at least, and what Wenzel wrote is a matrix element which embodies really this process which we were talking about. So the electron, the red electron here, goes from valence to core, and the blue electron goes to uh, valence to continuum. I was giving this talk in Cambridge one day and uh, this guy, Klaus Rudenberg, told me, well, uh, who, who made uh, his PhD with this guy, Gregor Wenzel, in Zurich, uh, told me, well, you know, Wenzel was really smoking. That's right. But I do have a non-smoking picture of Wenzel. Why don't you show it? And uh, I, I sent him the, 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 the scanned uh, paper from 97, which he for some reason didn't have as a material proof that uh, Fermi Golden Rule is uh, uh, Wenzel's. And I got this picture, so I'm now able to show you a politically correct slide. And that's how this talk is created. Uh, <laughs> so that's the anecdote. And uh, let's go briefly into the theory that uh, we are doing, we are not doing. Uh, Fermi Golden Rule. 
or uh, Vance of Golden Row, we are doing a uh, more complex, uh, involved quantum mechanical theory, which is called Fana theory of resonances, where I write a wave function as a superposition of bound and continuum states, and eventually we express uh, the rate of the decay or the time scale of the decay as some matrix element between two many electron wave functions and the Hamiltonian of the system. And uh, of course, here we could already see quantum chemistry starting to appear because how can we evaluate this if not by placing here the correct many electron wave functions in the correct many electron Hamiltonian? Okay, this is a busy slide. Uh, and it became even more busy when I put uh, Uven's book in the right place. We will see now why it's the right place for it. So what we are doing here, we are expanding our wave function in a series, which are like CI series, only that the reference now is not Hartree for ground state, it's perturbation theoretically corrected ground state. And as you see, there are this uh, creation, and, uh, creation and annihilation operators here. And of course, here is, uh, here is a bit of cheating because these uh, configurations are not spin adapted. We, of course, use spin adapted configurations. And as you go to higher excitation classes, you cannot avoid using uh, the correct spin functions, which are becoming more and more complex. And they can be found in this wonderful book by Ruben Pons. So here is, uh, here is the correct place for them. And that's how we do the quantum chemistry. We uh, do not do conventional quantum chemistry where we evaluate uh, energies because we have to evaluate the decay width. It's something, uh, something else, uh, something different. So we have to uh, construct a bound, artificially bound-like function and a continuum-like function. And we do this by realizing what are the channels of the decay and by putting all the closed channels into the uh, bound-like uh, state, all the open channels into the uh, yeah, it disappears, maybe not, uh, into the continuum-like state. So eventually, we have our phi and our chi produced by quantum chemistry with correct spin, and this is the way to evaluate gamma. It would have been the way, if not for the last technical difficulty, which is uh, we, are doing uh, we are doing the usual uh, quantum chemistry with Gaussian basis. So in fact, we never have the correct normalization of the continuum wave functions, and we have to do something about it. We have to interpolate and renormalize our integrals, and we do it with a smart technique, which is called stiltes chebyshev moment theory, and I do not think that I have time to go into the technicalities of stiltes chebyshev I only would like to show you this graph, which produces uh, total photoabsorption uh, cross-section of benzene molecule, using a uh, quantum chemical uh, technique with single and double excitations that, uh, if not for our methods, would have been uh, have to, to be obtained from the full denialization of this matrix, which is not really feasible. So we know how to do it with diagonalization of this kind of matrix, which is already much better. And that's our result. It compares pretty favorably with the experimental one, which is the black curve. Okay. So we do not do, do know how to do things efficiently. So and let's as so we construct we kind of constructed the machinery. Let's try to see now uh, what are the the physical results. What are the physical uh, effects that we want to explore? Well, first we are interested in Auger effect in the field of a in a field of positive charges. Let's take a simple uh, single charge for the beginning. And we all understand that a single charge can kind of hybridize our orbital, can change, break its symmetry, or if it goes, if it penetrates inside the orbital, it can shrink it. How does it come into play when we do when we study Auger? Well, let's uh, try some specific Auger process. This magnesium 2s ionized. Uh, we have.